You welcome back to DXB Today, where uh, we are, well, we're indulging ourselves in all things fashion, uh, from the top end luxury all the way down to grassroots, those looking to set out and more. And talking of that, setting up in the world of fashion, if you've got that dream uh, to take your brand to market, how do you go about it? Well, the person to ask is kindly joining us now, founder and CEO of Morris Global Consulting is of course Mo Morris. Thanks very much indeed for being with us. A pleasure, lovely to be here, guys. Listen, I'm conscious, I'm glad, glad that you've joined us now because conscious of the conversation we were having just a minute ago and I was thinking when we were talking about it, a lot of people think of Dubai they think of the malls they think of luxury fashion they think of the luxury stores etc is it a market though and is there the infrastructure in place for aspiring young desire designers who want to get a brand to market is this a good place to do it um, I definitely think it has improved a lot over the last we were having these conversations a decade ago and yeah. it was looking very different the infrastructure is definitely coming in. I think to Dubai in general, they're excellent at, you know, the arts and support and things like that. I do think there is a bit of a gap between the realities of being an entrepreneur in the fashion space mm. and what it actually takes to get that moving because production and manufacturing and all of that is relatively new to this region as mm. well. Whereas, you know, predominantly it's done in China yeah. or mm -hmm. other countries like this. So I think there's a little bit of a learning curve yet with that side of it. So I do think people kind of struggle a little bit. You can get to here, but I think when they're trying to, they launch small, which is absolutely fine. Mm. That's kind of what you have to do at the start, but it's expensive. It's, I feel like they get into difficulty at that kind of stage when they're trying to build it up to the next level so that they can maybe go abroad or go somewhere else to produce or to get better quality yeah. you know fabrics and things like that mm. so a bit of a mixed bag i would say depending on what kind of product you want and what type of uh, product you're developing for the market as well mm -hmm. so a little bit of both so and it also depends i think on where you want to position yeah. your brand What's the biggest question you get asked by young designers? How much is it going to cost <laughs> to start a brand? Yes. How <laughs> yeah. easy is it? So, exactly. <laughs> that is always the question. Yeah. And you know, there really is no answer to it. <laughs> How long is a piece of string, right? Do you want to do five products? Do you want to do 10 products? Are you doing golfware? Are you doing couture? Are you doing footwear? Are you doing jewelry? Are you doing whatever? So it really depends on what your vision is and you can cost that up accordingly. Mm -hmm. So there's no one size fits all, which as I know is an extremely frustrating answer for anybody who's starting out to get, but Especially that is the, the truth. industry. Absolutely. <laughs> but it is actually the truth. And of course you want to know how much it's going to cost you, but there's no answer to it until we know, okay, what exactly do you want to do? And there's all of the branding and marketing and digital and all of the other things that are requirements now, you know, they're not just nice to haves anymore. You have to pay to play, you know? I was going to ask you actually, what are some of the hidden costs? Because I think when people think of a brand, so they many. don't realize that there is a huge supply chain yeah. from, to get it from A to Z. Yeah, there is. There is like, I mean, you have your product, obviously. So like typically if we're starting uh, with a client and they are building a brand, let's take a menswear, kids wear, women's wear, anything like that. It's a 12 month development phase. So that is before you get any product out to the market, if you're doing it the right way. And that in that time, you are doing your product development, your design work, your research, all of that, getting your fabrics right, your sampling, your production. And then you're also at the same time building your brand, your messaging, your marketing strategies, your sales strategies, your B2B strategy, your B2C strategy, your you know website, your digital, like what are you going to do? How are you going to get it out there to the world? Are you going to sell on platforms and a bit of both? So there's a huge amount involved and I think where people really struggle, I think, is they take it into account the cost of the production as best they can. But what they don't do is put their profit margins correctly mm -hmm. because they're typically making small batches, which are very, very high. So you're not going to be making a lot of money per product or per unit when you are starting out. But what they fail to do is to balance that with, OK, what's it going to look like when I'm at 500 units per 
per product. What's it going to look like when I'm at a thousand units? Okay, where am I pricing myself in the market? Mm. What am I trying yeah. to achieve with it? That's the biggest thing. You cannot run a business. This, Amy, you're taking notes. Yeah, I'm going to say I'm taking notes because actually I was just saying to the guys that I'm thinking about like, well, thinking I'm in the process of starting an equestrian clothing line. Yeah. So you were touching on there like some of the misconceptions that there are in yeah. the industry. Can you like debunk some of those for us? Sure. Um, I think firstly, it's the time. Yeah. I think people rush to market. They get a couple of samples made, especially here in the region, because there are so many um, there are so many tailors and things like that. But that is not what you need when yeah. you are starting a brand. If you're trying to do a product correctly, you need technical drawings. And yeah. it's really, really quite technical. It's like building a house. Mm -hmm. You know, you need plans. Oh, good. Well, I've done that. I've, I've got tech packs already. Yes, exactly. OK, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing it right. So you're exactly you're on the right. You're on the right track. And then when you have that done, you're obviously going into your fabric sourcing and sampling mm -hmm. and production and all of that. But I think really where a lot of the misconceptions is, I, I feel like people don't really believe you mm -hmm. when you say how difficult it is going to be to make your mark on the market. Yeah. And I think that also goes back to the vision which you guys were speaking about earlier and making sure that there is a gap in the market for what you actually are doing. Mm -hmm. Because that's another you know, problem as well with people. If they see somebody or a company doing something they're like, okay, that's great. I'm going to do something yeah. similar. We saw yes. that, but with they the already wear, have that, didn't we? We yes. saw that huge wave of sportswear. Yes. Like everybody had their own sportswear yeah. yes. brand, and it's like everyone kind of jumps on the bandwagon. Exactly. Yeah. I wanted to ask you though, is it easier to have a shop online, for example, that will cut cost, or is it better to do your designs, have an open shop in the mall somewhere out out there? Because sometimes, like, if you have it online, then you don't have to make a lot of the clothing, people will order and then you make to order, mm. I think, is it? There's a, it depends on what kind of a product you have. If your consumer is waiting for a specific product, like a handbag or something that they are happy to wait for that is made to order, mm -hmm. then okay. But in this day and age, none of us want to wait for anything. So sure. made to order doesn't work unless it is a very niche specific type of product and your consumer base are happy that it is going to take four to six weeks or whatever the case is. So in general, I would say no. Um, and the, to answer your other part of the question is the, you know, the selling Brick online yeah. versus yeah. in bricks and mortar. Personally, I think that there is a huge shift going to happen going back towards bricks and mortar but for a small brand that is not realistic you don't have the budget you you don't have the the support that you need to be able to do it and realistically you need to be able to do both okay if you're doing it you know 30 seconds is all we've got left unfortunately we could talk for a lot longer but if there is one 30 second piece of advice you can give to aspiring designers out there who might have been inspired by what we're talking about to get started what is it i would say do your homework Get the right help. There's plenty of advice, but get the right help for you and take a bet on yourself. That's what I would say. Oh, because I love that. That's, that's really that's good. That's good. Yeah. But that's the basis of entrepreneurship. We've yeah. all done it. Yeah. yeah. I have my company because I took a bet on myself. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, so. Well, thank you very much, Mo, for joining us on today's show. My absolute pleasure. Today's Spotlight is on a homegrown jewellery brand, redefining affordability by bridging the gap between everyday wear and luxury uh, jewellery. Curated del for delicate and captivating accessories for women, this is Hiral Krupesh from Karat Craft. My name is Hiral and I'm the co-founder and creative director at Karat Craft. Caracraft is a brand that specializes in 18 karat gold and diamond jewelry. We make jewelry accessible to women of today. Caracraft is a conscious fine jewelry brand. Uh, we started this business to make sure that women were able to access modern jewelry at the ease of their fingertips. There were very less options for them to customize and provide a bespoke platform for people to create their jewelry. So Caracraft is that one destination where they can create a very unique piece as per their preference and as per their budget. I think change is challenging. So, um, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, when you're trying to you know, provide a platform that is very unique and still not in the market, it is very challenging. However, we found opportunities in this. Um, as 
in the Middle East, jewelry buying has been very traditional form of uh, you know business. So we wanted to provide an online platform where people get more choices to create their jewelry and also to choose the budget that they are truly looking for without burning their pockets. Dubai, as we call it, the city of gold, it is the perfect destination to either adapt a skill or start a new business because I believe Dubai has the hustler attitude which is able to adapt to any challenges that they face day in and day out. Dubai is home to me. I was born and brought up over here. So I believe just like when you're at home, you feel safe, happy and secure. That's how I feel in Dubai. Right, from crafts to chat. Now, who has got the best chat of them all? It is, of course, Amy. Indeed, Tom. Yes, it is now time for the roundup. So, Eamon Saeed, a 16-year-old Pakistani student from Jens Metropole School, recently won global recognition for creating a sustainable fashion show that raised 30,000 dirhams for charitable causes. Now, Eamon crafted ensembles from throwaway scraps and weaved together outfits with discarded fabric. So once again, it brings us back to the talk of sustainability within the fashion industry. Obviously, that was very prevalent at COP28. We had huge designers such as Stella McCartney, who was present talking about sustainability. But the question I guess I'm going to throw to you is, is the fashion industry investing enough in this discussion of sustainability? Rosamund, what do you think? First of all, that's amazing about a student from Dubai making such an impact and a positive impact. When it comes to sustainability, I think the conversation is there. And I think we always have to follow progress and that is the right track. So when you look at COP28 and how they've incorporated fashion, when you also see that so many big organizations have a sustainability um, element to it, whether it's a Shalu group or an LVMH, these caring group, they all have implemented it. And I, I think people always want change to happen so quickly, but I think as long as you're moving in the right direction, then you know you're, you are making an impact. So the thing that I've always had, the, the, the issue, I, I, I really appreciate what you're saying there. And I, and, and I think that the industry needs to, to, can do more, is doing more, is doing as much as they can. But you made a really good point earlier on when you compare it to cosmetics. With cosmetics or even food to a certain degree, you look at the ingredients that are going in to a, a cosmetic and you can make that call. When you make an ethical or sustainable choice on a garment, are you that convinced as to where it was made or how it was made, etc., or is it just a buy that you need? You know, you go out with it, something in mind, or maybe you don't have something in mind, but you want to make that buy. Oh, that'd be nice. Yeah. I don't know whether we've crossed that line when it comes to sustainability mm. in the fashion industry than maybe we have in others. Not through want of trying. I think brands are having like more like s sustainable collections. I know H&M, for example, they did like a, a, you know, that's like kind of more general retail, but like they had a whole collection that was like sustainable. And I think brands yeah. are having that kind of collections that they're specifying that like are in that range. Yeah. But also from a consumer point of view, they're also cho like everyone has a choice now and, and retailers are giving the consumer that choice so when you check out of an online most of the big online stores they actually give you a choice like do you want eco-friendly packaging or do you want the give big gift box with the wrapping yeah. and so these are all choices that consumers have mm -hmm. yeah. um, and you know your impact can be a little bit small steps or they can be big leaps but it, it comes down to everyone's um, own personal choice but I, I do personally see that there is a lot of change happening Good. Well, it's still amazing and I like that all the fashion brands are taking that step towards sustainability. But next up, we're diving into the ever-evolving landscape of fashion trends with the CEO of Showcase Middle East. Plus, Lauren's already for you, so stay tuned. 